All right, well, good evening, everybody. We'll be out of here by 9. It'll be great. <laughs> uh, that's why we came to church, right? Hear the Word of God. So uh, let's uh, turn your Bibles to Matthew chapter 21, if you would. Matthew 21. And uh, take a minute here. We'll pray, and then we'll get into the Word of God. So uh, let's pray. Dear Heavenly Father, God, I come before you this, to this evening, Lord, and I just thank you for uh, your word. Uh, Lord, I thank you for being able to um, be blessed with this opportunity. I don't take it lightly, Lord. Um, please uh, speak through me tonight, Lord. Take away anything that's not you, and uh, just help me to be a blessing to these people, Lord. I love you. I thank you. In Jesus' name, amen. <clears throat> so uh, we're in Matthew chapter 21. Before I read, I just want to give a brief introduction. I know pastor usually reads first, but... The reading won't make much sense unless I give you an introduction. So uh, for the youth group and I, we have been uh, going through the book of Matthew on Wednesday nights. We started last Christmas, and so we're still still in Matthew. We, we covered 21 uh, this last Wednesday, and I thought it was really an appropriate message, and I, I thought that um, it would be good for you guys as well. And so um, one of the things that I took from the gospel account of Matthew and Jesus' ministry throughout this whole study and, and through uh, looking through what he's done and what he taught, um, is his attempt to expose the difference between religion and a relationship. His attempt to show the Jews that the word of God that they had been given was squandered, and they were now living a, 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 an existence that wasn't pleasing to God. And as I read that, and you know, he, he constantly... Um, is telling the Pharisees and showing them their mistakes, showing them where they've messed up, and not in judgment, but in love, because he wants them to realize that they don't actually know God. And so he constantly stressed, he repeated, he illustrated, he begged the people to see the two choices, to see God and to see themselves, to see what they were doing and see what they were supposed to be doing. And one choice would bring us death. We know that religion brings death. I, I talk to people all the time, and they say, I'm not really into that religious thing. I say, neither, neither am I. Um, and, but a relationship brings us into a sweet, a loving fellowship with God. And religion will slowly separate us from God and other people. And so briefly, just I'm just going to define these two things for you and we'll get right into it. Um, so for the purposes of tonight, religion is, is a system of worship where man offers God what he thinks God wants in exchange for favor here and in the next life, and for blessings and whatever else they think they can get from God. Okay, we got that. And a relationship, if you've been around Baptists for any length of time, and I've been in a Baptist church since I was a little kid, um, you've heard people say that what we have is a, a relationship, not a religion. And what they mean by that is that what we do, how we serve the Lord, is not driven out of fear of judgment. It's not driven out of a hope of blessing. We're not trying to save ourselves. We're not trying to earn our personal justification. We're simply doing it out of love for God. And that should be what drives all of us in our relationship with God. So this idea is based on the Bible's hardline stance about our wicked, wicked, empty, empty heart. And so the Bible says that uh, there's none righteous, no, not one. Jeremiah 17, 9 says, The heart is deceitful above all things and desperately wicked. Who can know it? And so we know that regardless of how well we try, we can never please God in our flesh. And this is what religion tries to do. Romans 5, 6 straight says, For when we were yet without strength in due time, Christ died for the ungodly. For scarcely for a righteous man will one die. Yet peradventure for a good man, some would even dare to die. But God commendeth his love toward us, and that while we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. So we know that our state is helpless and hopeless without God. I think that video beautifully dovetailed into the end of this, into this message here. But the Bible says in 1 John 4, 19, that we love him because he first loved us. We live our lives out of a love for him because he first loved us. And that's the way it's always been to get to God is through a relationship. Even before Jesus Christ came, any of the spiritual characters in the Old Testament, they didn't have a ritual uh, system of, of worship. It was a relationship, a loving relationship. You see David, you see Abraham, you see Moses. These people knew God intimately. And so this is what Christ is contending with in his ministry and what we still fight outwardly in our own flesh today. So 
in our text here in Matthew chapter 21, which we'll read in a second, we're seeing the last few days of Christ's ministry. We're seeing him coming to an end and recognizing that his time is near. He's, he's getting ready to be offered. And in the ministry up till this point, and we've been going through it chapter by chapter, we've seen him briefly mention things. We've seen him give the Pharisees parables about their religion. He's tried to tell them, listen, what you have is not real. What you have is not right. But he's been kind of careful because he knew these men. He knew that if he came right out and blatantly came after them, it'd probably mean the end of his life. And at this point, he knows the end is coming. And so in this chapter here, he really rears back and lets it fly. He, he goes right at them. He shows them the emptiness of their hearts. And so today we're going to look at the fruits of religion, what we get from it if we live a religious life, and our responsibility as Christians in light of that. And so let's uh, stand, if you would, and read. we'll read verse number 1. We'll stretch our legs a little bit. 1 through 11. Matthew 21, it says, And when they drew nigh unto Jerusalem and were come to Bethpage under the Mount of Olives, then sent Jesus two disciples, saying unto them, Go into the village over against you, and straightway you shall find an ass tied and a colt with her. Loose them and bring them unto me. And if any man say aught unto you, he shall say, The Lord hath need of them, and straightway he will send them. All this was done that it might be fulfilled, which was spoken by the prophet, saying, Tell ye the daughter of Zion, Behold, thy king cometh unto thee, meek, and sitting upon an ass, and a colt the full of an ass. And the disciples went and did as Jesus commanded them, and brought the ass and the colt, and put on them their clothes, and they set him thereon. And a very great multitude spread their garments in the way. Others cut down branches from the trees and strawed them in the way. And the multitudes that went before and that followed cried, saying, Hosanna to the Son of David. Blessed is he that cometh in the name of the Lord. Hosanna in the highest. And when he was coming to Jerusalem, all the city was moved, saying, Who is this? And the multitude said, This is Jesus, the prophet of Nazareth of Galilee. Thank you. You may, be, you may be seated. So our first point this evening, the first thing I'd like us to see is the excitement of religion. Now, if you're a young person here tonight, you might think, what's exciting about religion, right? <laughs> I think religion is boring. I think it's a bunch of people in, in a dusty building. You ever notice that most churches have the same smell? You walk in, and you're like... That's the old church smell. <laughs> As a young person, we might think that about religion. But here in these verses, we see what's called the triumphal entry. And up until this point, Jesus' ministry has been very private. He would heal someone. He would tell them, hey, listen, don't tell anyone that I did this for you. Just keep it between you and me. Go serve the Lord. And these people would go tell everyone and, um, you know, completely expose him. But this is the only time in Jesus' ministry when he made a showy public appearance on purpose. So as we were covering the last few chapters in youth group and, and going through Matthew 18, 19, 20, we see that in the, in the last few um, days, Jesus has been telling his disciples, we're going to go to Jerusalem. I'm going to be crucified. I'm going to die. The chief priests are going to kill me, and I'll rise again the third day. And we keep seeing these disciples not understanding what he's saying. I don't, he, he couldn't have been more plain with what he said. He used plain language. There was no parable um, but what they had was an idea of what God was to them, what Christ was to them. And they thought that he was going to come. He was going to reclaim Jerusalem. He was going to kick Rome out. He was going to rule and reign. And they were going to be part of that kingdom. And so this flew right in the face of what they thought Christ was and who they thought Christ was. They're confused. They even said, not so, Lord. This is not going to happen to you. Um, Jesus had to tell Peter, get thee behind me, Satan. And so... They're coming here to Jerusalem. They're getting close. They know that something's going to happen, but they're not really sure what. And as they get close to the city, his usual pattern was to kind of just slip in, end up in the temple and start teaching and healing and doing whatever. He was kind of secretive. But in this instance, they get close to the city and Jesus says, go get me a colt so I can ride into the city. And there's no doubt in my mind that some of those disciples knew the prophecy knew that he was going to ride in on a colt, and they thought, this is it. He's going to do it. We're going we're gonna to parade into the city. People are going to come, and people are going to believe, and this is, it's going to happen. And they thought, oh, well, whatever he told us was not true. <laughs> They're still clinging to hope that somehow his crucifixion and the things that he said was just a mistake. And so not only does their hope get stirred when he says this, but then they get the colt, which is a miracle in and of itself. They, they, they set him on the animal, 
And he starts riding into the city, and groups of people, throngs of people are coming out of the city. Hosanna to the Son of David. Hosanna. Blessed is he that comes in the name of the Lord. And they're, and they're praising him. And they've never had an entrance like this before. Jesus has been thronged, but he's been kind of a, a, a um, controversial figure in their society. And so <laughs> they're seeing something they never saw before, and they think, this is it. This is it again. Jesus is here. He's going to take the city. He's going to be the king. And although they didn't perfectly grasp everything Christ said, they had one trait that set them apart from the crowd that was screaming Hosanna. They had one trait that made them, that proved that they had a relationship with God. They'd seen Jesus, just like the crowd, they'd seen Jesus do some incredible things. He'd multiplied food. He'd calmed storms. He'd healed lepers. Blind men were given sight. Recently, he'd just healed Lazarus and brought him back to life. And so this crowd is excited. But they saw those miracles, and from them they derived that Christ was God. Jesus said, Whom do men say that I the Son of Man am? And they said, You know, some say that you're John the Baptist, some Elias, others Jeremiah or one of the prophets. And Jesus said, But whom say ye that I am. And Simon Peter said, Thou art the Christ, the Son of the living God. And so even though they weren't perfect in their intentions, in their understanding of who Christ was, just like none of us are, they got one thing right. They did the right thing with Jesus. They understood who he was. They desired him. They obeyed him because they loved him, because of their relationship, not because of their religion. And so as we start to look at this crowd, <laughs> it would seem that they have the same testimony as the disciples. Well, we see, you know, they probably felt like they were one happy family coming in. Everyone was cheering and, and calling him the son of David. They're worshiping Christ. They're welcoming him. And we see, and we know, hindsight is twenty twenty, that the crowd had one difference from the disciples. We know that they had cold hearts. They said the right thing. They praised the right person. They seemingly believed the right truths, but there was something missing. Luke, Luke 19 tells us that as Jesus was proceeding into the city, the crowds are cheering, people are thronging him, that he wept over the city. That praise didn't move him to joy. It moved him to sorrow because he knew the condition of their hearts. And he knew who they were and what they thought of him. So if you look down in verse number 9, the multitudes that went before him that followed cried, saying, Hosanna to the Son of David. Blessed is he that cometh in the name of the Lord. Hosanna in the highest. And this title that they're giving him is not some cheap title. They're not telling, saying that he's just a good guy. He's just a prophet. He's just a good teacher, which is what a lot of people say about Jesus. They're saying the Son of David is, is a direct call, naming him the Christ, naming him the Son of God, calling him Messiah. And in verse 10, when he was coming to Jerusalem, all the city was moved, saying, who is this? And the multitude said, listen to what they say about him. This is Jesus, the prophet of Nazareth of Galilee. There's nothing wrong with calling Jesus a prophet, but it's a far cry from calling him Christ. We see that this crowd had the right ideas in public. They got excited. They had people with them. The disciples were no doubt cheering Hosanna to the Son of David with them. And so they look good. They get excited. They get worked up. They're cheering. They're, they're doing well. And when it comes down to it, they don't recognize Jesus as Christ. The Jews were following the crowd. They loved Jesus for what he could give them and not for who he was. And uh, I think of the times when Jesus said, you know, they just love me. They wanted to make him king because he multiplied bread. It's probably a crowd full of men in that instance. We're like, yeah, he fed us. Let's go. You're the king. But these people loved Christ for what they could, he could give them, what they could see. I, I think of Herod when he came to his judgment hall and, and Herod wanted to see him do some miracle. And so, so many of us as Christians, and I see this a ton with young people, is that our ministry to them is to try and get them excited about the things of God. We try and put these things and we put these programs together and we try and get all this excitement and work them up and we say, that'll get them to follow Christ. But all that gets them is empty religion. All that gets them is an excitement in their heart. If you've ever felt that, you've been in a meeting, wow, God is good, that's so good. And then you get home, you get back in the, the valley, <laughs> and it slowly, slowly dies. You think, what's wrong with me? That's excitement. That's religion. That's not a relationship. I know that in any relationship, and I told this to the teens, if you get into any relationship and you start it off with what you can get and not what you can give, it's never going to last. And so I know in, in the case of my wife, if I, if I 
got into that relationship and I said, man, she's really beautiful. She's well-respected. She plays a beautiful piano. I could gain a lot from being married to her. <laughs> My marriage wouldn't last very long. And so when we come to Christ, it's no different. I think of in chapter 19, the rich young ruler came to Jesus and he said, what must I do to inherit eternal life? And Jesus told him, and it didn't work for him. He said, you know what? I thought I was going to be able to get something and add that to the things that I already have. I didn't really want to sacrifice. That's not going to work for me. And he left, unsaved, unregenerate, still questioning his eternal destiny. And so Mark 4, 16, he talks about the seed that was stone, sown on stony ground. He says, and they, these are they likewise which are sown on stony ground, who when they have heard the word, immediately they receive it with gladness and have no root in themselves. And so endure, but for a time, afterward when affliction or persecution ariseth, for the word's sake, immediately they are offended. And we see that this truth was proved a few days later when Jesus was put out in front of them again. And instead of saying, Hosanna to the son of David, what were they saying? Cru crucify him, crucify him. We see that this crowd did not have a relationship with God. They had religion. The, Matthew 15, 8, Jesus said these words. He said, this people draweth nigh unto me with their mouth and honoreth me with their lips, but their heart is far from me. So we see that the first fruits of religion are these. It follows excitement. It gets really worked up. It gets going. We say, let's do it. Let's go. It's founded in getting, not in who Christ is and what he, you can give to him. I told the teens this morning, we were in Romans chapter 6, I said, if you come to God with any other purpose other than surrender, he's not going to accept it. And, so, and also, it does not endure because of lack of foundation. So those three things are the first fruits that we see of religion. Look in verses number 12 and number 13. We'll really get into the meat here. He says, And Jesus went into the temple of God, and cast out all them that sold and bought in the temple and overthrew the tables of the money changers and the seats of them that sold doves and said unto them, It is written, My house shall be called the house of prayer, but ye have made it a den of thieves. So the first point is we see the excitement of religion. Secondly, we're going to see the corruption of religion. We're told in John chapter 2 that Jesus cleansed the temple at the beginning of his ministry and then in Matthew, Mark, and Luke we're, see, we're shown that he cleanses it at the end of of his ministry. Mark shows us that this isn't just a random act of anger. It says that Jesus entered into Jerusalem. He went into the temple. When he looked about on all things, he went out into Bethany and he came back the next day and tore into them. We see that the Jews had done a thing that was despicable in the eyes of God. As a nation, they were a people entrusted with God's word. God gave them the word of God. He gave them the promises of God. He spoke with them face to face. He allowed them to worship him like no other nation had. And it wasn't for them to hoard. It was for them to share. And they took this, and instead of sharing the knowledge of God with others, instead of teaching the world about who God is, instead of living righteously and holy, holy before God, they got selfish with the truth that God gave them. They got selfish and they hoarded it, and they even went so far, as we'll see here, to profit from their religion at the expense of people that were seeking God, that were trying to find who God is. And so, briefly, we're just going to see what, what happened in the temple here. So the temple was designed with an inner and an outer court. And I'm not going to bore you with this, because I can already see some of us have fallen asleep. <laughs> but the outer court was designed... For the Gentiles. It was where, there where the Gentiles could come, they could worship God, the Jews could come, they would bring their sacrifices. This is where a lot of things happened, but mainly it was there so that the Gentiles could come and worship God in the temple. They were not allowed in the inner court, they were not allowed in the holy place. That was only for the Jews. And what was happening is that the Pharisees of the day, the religious leaders of the day, who had religion but no relationship, had set up a system initially for convenience for people. They'd have offerings that they could sell, lambs that were without spot and blemish. Um, but eventually, <laughs> and we'll see, whenever something is established in religion and not with a relationship, greed takes over every single time. And so they had these lambs, and then eventually they got this idea that when people came into the temple, they couldn't accept pagan money. They couldn't accept money with any other inscription, any other leader, pagan leader on it. So they would exchange that money for temple money 
kind of like I told the teens, <laughs> they're like Chuck E. Cheese tokens, you know, <laughs> you, you change it and you <laughs> um, some of the older people won't know what I'm saying. Um, and so they would exchange that money so that people could use that money in the temple. And then when people would bring an offering, they'd say, you know, that, that, that lamb is really not good enough. You really should buy a temple lamb. And they said, well, okay, all right, if that's what you say. And so they'd go to buy a temple lamb. they say, you have to have temple money. And so when they would exchange money, they would take extra. They would cheat the people from their money. And then they would make them buy offerings and take the ones that they brought. And so these people were creating hindrances for others trying to get to God. Not only that, they were making the offering of God hateful because people knew if I come into the temple, I'm going to get cheated. My money's going to get taken. I'm not going to be able to worship the way I want. Nothing I bring is going to be good enough for God. And they were keeping people away. It was actually estimated, and I have no idea where this number came from, that Caiaphas, the high priest, was making $3 million a year off of this racket. And $3 million back then is quite a bit. Um, I, again, I have no idea where that number came from. <laughs> but... And so, not only was, were they cheating people, but then they were making this court of the Gentiles, which was still meant to be a place of worship, a place where people could come and see God, seek his face, come before him. They were making it a loud, stinking, commotion-filled marketplace and making the worship of God by others virtually impossible. But their inner court was clean, quiet, easy to worship in. It reminds me of the sons of Eli who took the sacrifices of God for themselves as priests and they did the service of God without knowing God. They were priests who didn't know him. And in 1 Samuel 2 it says, Wherefore the sin of the young men was very great before the Lord for men abhorred the offering of the Lord. And so religion actually caused people to hate offering things to God, to hate worshiping God. And we see this in our own lives and we see this in the lives of people who don't understand who God is. When acts are born out of fear, when they're born out of a desire for blessing, when we're, we're, we're chasing after God for any other reason than him alone and his person and surrender to him, what's going to happen is that we're going to cause other people to trip on what we think is service to God. Not only do we make this, the worship of God in our own lives dead, but we keep other people from getting the help that they need. That is a very great sin before God. And so, we see that religion perverts the worship of God and misrepresents God, which is huge. I've seen a lot of people preach a lot of messages hammering young people on standards and telling them that, you know, that you can't listen to this music, you can't listen to that music, and their interpretation of what Scripture says and their religious ideals. And what they're doing is they're misrepresenting God. They're taking the name of God in vain. They're saying, this is what God wants you to do when it's nowhere in here. And I, I tell the young people all the time, and even in our studies on Sunday morning, we, we do a Bible study. I say, if you give me an answer to something, a question that I ask, and the answer is not found in Scripture, it means nothing. <laughs> if you give me your opinion, sorry, that doesn't really do it for me. And so we see that it misrepresents God. It causes people to hate God and keeps them from him. And have you ever met somebody who was burned by religion? doesn't want anything to do with God anymore because someone who was religious hurt them. Right? I know a lot of people like that. Religion looks beautiful on the outside, but inside, Christ said, it's full of dead men's bones. So look at this. Look in verse 14. I think this is really just a beautiful picture. Well, let's start in 13. He said unto them, It is written, My house should be called the house of prayer, but ye have made it a den of thieves. And I want you to picture what's happening here. He's running around. He's working up a sweat. He's kicking people out. He's telling them to leave. And I want you to remember, this is not a man. This is God cleaning out his own house. Saying, people are trying to get to me. What are you doing? How do you think this is okay? And he's kicking them out with authority. And they're scared. They ran. People are spreading. There's commotion. I'm sure there's animals running around. Money. He's flipping the money tables. I'm sure there's money all over the place. People are grabbing their stuff and they're leaving. And I picture in verse 14, it says, In the blind and the lame came to him in the temple and he healed them. And so this might just be my, my interpretation. This might be my imagination, but I, I picture him working up a sweat. I picture him breathing heavy. He's got his disciples with him and everybody leaves. That court is quiet for the first time in a long time. And I picture Jesus sitting on a step, breathing. He's angry. He has a right to be. He's God. 
And then I picture slowly, they, they see a figure start coming in, and it's, it's a lame man. He's being carried by a couple of his friends. And they heard that God is in that room. They heard that now the way is clear. I can get to God. I can get the help that I need. I see some blind men being let in. I say, come on, come on. God's over here. And when God got rid of religion, when he cleared the path to God, he wiped it clean, people could come and get the help that they needed. And I know that when I read that, I saw that in my own heart, is that so often I get so concerned with the standards of religion, the way that things are supposed to look, the way that things are supposed to be, how I'm used to it being, and not always what the Bible says, and not always what God says. I, I think in, earlier in Matthew, he says, if you'd learn what this means, I will have mercy and not sacrifice. He says, I want people to be helped. And he kept trying to tell the Pharisees, you're keeping people from me. They thought they were leaders of the blind. They thought they were guiding people in, and instead, they were pushing people away. I, I love that Jesus was the one who cleared the Gentile court. He cleaned it, and he made the way clear to God again for the Gentiles. Praise the Lord that he did that for you and for me. I'm glad he did because otherwise I wouldn't be here today. So we see that uh, in verse 14, the blind and the lame came to him in the temple and he healed them. In verse 15, and when the chief priests and scribes saw the wonderful things that he did and the children crying in the temple saying, Hosanna to the son of David, they praised the Lord. Mm -mm. They were sore displeased. They saw people getting help they saw people needy that were lost and in bondage and were coming out freed. We're singing Hosanna to the Son of David and they were angry about it. And we see that religion doesn't like true relationship because it reveals the emptiness and the coldness of what they have. So we see that it follows the excitement. It's founded in getting not in who Christ is. It doesn't endure because of lack of foundation. It perverts the worship of God and misrepresents God. It causes people to hate God, and it keeps them from him. It looks beautiful, but it's full of dead men's bones. And our last point, and we'll be out of here, the condemnation of religion. If you look down in verse number 18, it says, Now in the morning as he returned into the city, he hungered. And when he saw a fig tree in the way, he came to it and found nothing thereon but leaves only, and said unto it, Let no fruit grow on thee, henceforward, forever and presently the fig tree withered away and the cursing of the fig tree is kind of a intriguing story um, it's mentioned in three of the four gospels so we know that it's important but why would Jesus care about a tree you ever wonder that in all of this commotion he's he's focusing on cleansing religion he knows he's going to die in a few days he goes out of his way to curse a tree and kill it <laughs> you ever wonder why that why that happened well the tree is really a succinct picture of what Christ found when he came to his people. He came to a people expecting fruit and finding none. It's really a lamentation over someone who's trapped in a hopeless cycle of doing to please God and not understanding that God is the answer himself. The leaves signify a picture of health, prosperity, happiness, the nation of Israel had this form of godliness, it says, but they denied the power thereof. They looked good, but right in the center, they were dead because they had no living relationship with God. Paul points this out in Romans chapter 10. He says, For I bear them record that they have a zeal of God, but not according to knowledge. For they being ignorant of God's righteousness and going about to establish their own righteousness, have not submitted themselves unto the righteousness of God. Take your Bibles really quick. Turn to Luke chapter 13. Luke chapter 13, and, and honestly, boiling down Matthew, we've been going through Romans, boiling that down, really the secret in the Christian life is not trying to do it ourselves, it's submitting to God and allowing him to work through us. Luke chapter 13, verse number 6, and this again seems kind of like a random parable wedged into a chapter that doesn't seem to fit. But it's also about a fig tree. If you look down in verse number 6, he says, He spake also this parable, a certain man had a fig tree planted in his vineyard, and he came and sought fruit thereon and found none. Then said he unto the dresser of this vineyard, Behold, these three years I come seeking fruit on this fig tree and find none. Cut it down. Why cumbereth it the ground? 
And he answering said unto him, Lord, let it alone this year till I shall dig about it and dung it. And if it bear fruit well, and if not, then after that thou shalt cut it down. And, and I find this very interesting. And again, I may just be interjecting my own interpretation of the text, but um, how long was Jesus' ministry? About three years, right? So Jesus came seeking fruit on this fig tree for three years. He's looking, he's trying, he's saying, man, I'll give you a chance, give me something. And after three years, he says, I, I find none. And he says, why come birth at the ground? Cut it, cut it down. Get rid of it. In uh, Matthew, back in Matthew, verse number 19, he says, let no fruit grow on thee, henceforward forever. And if we look at the nation of Israel, from that point, if they ever brought anyone closer to God? From that point, has, has Israel ever had the presence of God in their life? The fruit ended. God cut it down. So look, look with me in verse number 42 of this chapter. <laughs> chapter 21, Matthew 21, verse 42. I'm sorry. Jesus saith unto them, and I love this statement, Did ye never read in the scriptures, the stone which the builders rejected, the same is become the head of the corner? This is the Lord's doing, and it is marvelous in our eyes. Therefore I say unto you, the kingdom of God shall be taken from you and given to a nation, bringing forth the fruits thereof. And whosoever shall fall on this stone shall be broken, but on whomsoever it shall fall, it will grind him to powder. And so, ultimately, what this boils down to, and what we can take from this sermon, is that Jesus Christ is the chief cornerstone. He is the basis of our relationship with God. Our little lives all depend on what we do with him. And, and as Christians, sometimes we, we limit that to salvation. We think, well, I did the right thing with Jesus at salvation. I got saved. He came into my heart. He lives within me. But every single day, we need to be careful not to be going about in dead orthodoxy. We need to be careful not to be following a list of rules that we've concocted in our own minds. And we need to submit again to God. We need to recognize that he's the one that calls the shots. He's the one that does the work. Nothing in my flesh is worth anything. And he says here that whosoever falls on the stone will be broken. But on whomsoever it shall fall, it will grind him to powder. So submitting to Christ in love, it takes some brokenness. It takes you looking at your own flesh. And when we've been going through Romans, it, Paul hammers it home again and again and again, is that in my flesh... In me dwells no good thing. Not sometimes there's good things. Not after I'm saved I can com commit some good things. I can, I can do something to please God. In my flesh there's nothing good. There's no redeeming qualities in you and I. And that's actually a comfort because God can take something that is broken. That has no redeeming qualities. No usefulness in our eyes. And he can use it for his glory if it's submitted to him. When my flesh is broken my sins are before me. There's no payment that I can make that justifies me in my sight, in God's sight. I have to cast myself on God's mercies. I have to trust that he can change me. He can use me. He can work through me. When we trust in our flesh and attempt to fulfill the law in our own power, what we're doing, even after we're saved, is again, we're misrepresenting who God is. And we're putting trust in who we are and not in who he is. And all those results of religion that I just gave you will be true about our lives if we don't rely on him. So the conclusion is really simple. And if you would, turn to Romans chapter 8, and we'll, we'll close with this. What is your walk with God? What is my walk with God comprised of? It's very easy to take a saved person, and it's very easy to get orthodox, to get comfortable in Christianity, to say, this is how it's done. It's very easy to have dead ritual. Is, it, is our religion profiting us or is it profiting God? As that video was saying, are we sitting comfortable in our own little chairs or are we taking what God's giving us and giving it to others? The mistake is when we hear about Israel and we hear about the failures, catastrophic failures all throughout their history that they had with the word of God, how they did not use it properly. The mistake is to look at them and condemn them and think, how, how dare they? How could they possibly fail that way? And what we really should be doing is thinking, God cut that fig tree down and he gave us the word of God. What are we doing with it? Am I misrepresenting God? Am I, am I profiting in, in religion? Am I following the
the crowd? Am I loving God just for what he gives me, not because of who he is? Is Christ just a means to an end? Is he just a salvation? Is he just a mansion in heaven? Or is he Lord of your heart? Religion is a grief of heart to God and it's deadness to us. And like I said, the mistake would be looking at Israel and not seeing ourselves. If you look in Romans chapter 8, I told you to turn there and I didn't. Romans chapter 8, verse number 1, we'll read down through verse number 6. He says, There is therefore now no condemnation to them which are in Christ Jesus, who walk not after the flesh, but after the Spirit. For the law of the Spirit of life in Christ Jesus hath made me free from the law of sin and death. For what the law could not do in that it was weak through the flesh, God sending his own Son in the likeness of sinful flesh, and for sin, condemned sin in the flesh. He says that the righteousness of the law might be fulfilled in us who walk not after the flesh, but after the Spirit. For they that are after the flesh do mind the things of the flesh, but they that are after the Spirit, the things of the Spirit. And really, take a moment and get this verse. For to be carnally minded is death, but to be spiritually minded is life and peace. So Israel was dead. They were walking in commandments of men. They were suppressed by men who didn't have a living relationship with God. They were led by these people. Are you quickened by your walk with God? Are you driven by his love? Are you encouraged by his grace? Or are you still stuck in that religious cycle of trying to be good enough for God? Because Romans says, none of us can be. 2 Corinthians 5.17 says, Therefore, if any man be in Christ, he is a new creature. Old things are passed away. Behold, all things are become new. And that happens only when we submit who we are to God and not try and do it ourselves. Let's pray. Lord, I come before you. I thank you again for your word. And uh, just what this uh, sermon taught me, Lord, about who I am and in light of who you are. And a lot of times, Father, we need just a, uh, just a reset. Lord, we need to understand that uh, we're nothing. You're everything. And often, you know, as a Christian, even as a saved person, I've tried so hard to please you. And in trying, I just get more frustrated, just get more condemnation heaped upon my head. I just can't do it. And the answer isn't in trying, the answer is in submitting. And so, Lord, I pray that you'd help each of us tonight to recognize the areas in our life that we're living in deadness. We're living in religion, and, and what it's doing is it's actually keeping people away from God. It's misrepresenting who you are. And I pray that you'd help us each to be honest and uh, just to be who you'd have us to be in light of your word. We love you, Lord. We thank you for who you are. In Jesus' name, amen. amen. Yes, sir. Let's have a piano player. Let's stand. That was an excellent, outstanding message we had just heard. And uh, we're either in a dead religion or a living relationship. And I got news for you. Each and every one of us has some areas of our life where we're going through the mechanics. We, we, we're dead, and we're just doing the routine in a particular area of our life. And uh, we need to examine ourselves tonight. Let's talk to the Lord about the things we've heard. Let's get back to a living relationship with a living God. All right, altars open. Let's speak to God for a moment. It is a little late, but I was telling Brother McKee before, I said, you know, if we got out at, right at 7, everyone would stick around and talk for an hour and a half after church was over. That's how we normally do things. Uh, so, But it's been a good night to be in the house of the Lord. And um, Pamela Roth, 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 Roth,
My son wanted to know if you're related to the football player. Okay. Okay. But um, can you sneak back there to your table and uh, make sure that you thank her for being with us and make sure that you give one of her cards and be praying for her and her ministry. And also thank uh, Brother Jonathan tonight, too, for just uh, bringing us a great message. That was really good, folks. That was really good. And, uh, and so we praise the Lord for that. I'm, I thank, I'm thankful for uh, Jonathan and his ministry here in our church. So let's pray for Marcus. All right? Join with me. Let's pray over Marcus, okay? Lord, we love you, and we thank you for being such a good God to us. And, Lord, we thank you just for uh, knowing us before the foundations of the earth. And, Lord, we thank you for Marcus. We will hold him up. We pray that you would bless this young man, watch over him, protect him. And, Lord, bless him as he goes away to university. Uh, Lord, I pray that you would just help both his mind and his heart. And, Lord, I pray that you would protect him and bless him, keep him away from evil people. And I pray that you would put just good people in his path. And, Lord, help him to find a good church and a, a good group of people to fellowship with. Lord, I pray that you just strengthen him and bless his life. And, Lord, we pray that you just... Just uh, work in a special way, Marcus. Lord, I pray that you'd bless us tonight. Give us a safe journey home. Thank you for all that we've been able to enjoy in your house. We pray these things in Jesus' name. Amen and amen. Let's be dismissed. Thank you so much for watching the video today. We hope you enjoyed it. If you'd like to find out more information about our ministry, you can visit us at lbbc.org. Info. Also, we'd love to hear from you. You can email us at mylbbc at gmail. We would love to send you a copy of this book right here. It's called Done, What Most Religions Don't Tell You About the Bible. Also, I do a little bit of writing. You can visit my blog at pastorjack.org. God bless you. And if there's any way we can help you, we'd love to be a blessing to you. Have a good day.